Department of Physics, Jaira Janapakyam College for Women Periculum, welcomes you all for the international webinar on functional properties and band gap engineering of ZNO GAN alloys. Let us all start the program with a prayer. Bible reading, reading from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Word of the Lord, thanks be to God. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. A. Jacqueline Regina Mary, convener of the conference, head and associate professor of physics, to welcome the gathering. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A warm welcome to everyone attending this webinar. I am Dr. Jacqueline, Head, Department of Physics, Sarah Janabakim College, Periculum. This college is situated on the southern part of India, near Kodai Hills, Kodai Kanal Hills. I would like to extend a cordial welcome to our principal, Reverend Sister Dr. Jayasrani, to this webinar. She is the one who motivated us to host this webinar. Welcome you, sister. I invite our secretary, Reverend Sister Dr. B.J. Coinsley Jayanti, who is the charismatic leader of our institution. I invite you to this webinar, sister. I extend a hearty welcome to our resource person, Dr. Vigard Olsen, lab manager, University of Oslo, Norway. I would like to take a few moments to introduce our chief guest to our participants. Dr. Olsen is an employee of SINTEF, which is one of the Europe's largest independent research organization. He has completed his master's in the material engineering and nanotechnology at the University of Oslo. He has completed his uh, doctoral degree in the same university. His academic interests are semiconductor physics, focusing on functional oxides. He works with materials used in solar cells, LEDs, and other optoelectronic applications. He has authored five papers in reviewed international scientific journals, and he is also the reviewer of the journal Super Lattices and Microstructures. He works as a lab manager in the microsystems and a nanotechnology laboratory which is known as Mina Lab in Oslo, Norway, Science Park. This lab was the result of joint investment of Research Council of Norway and Scientific Organization Europe. Mina Lab played a major role in the development of high-level high research quality. So far, it has developed aircraft pressure gauges, heart, artificial heart valves, hearts, etc. One of the MINA Lab's radiation detectors contributed to the discovery of Higgs boson and other sensors. We have a privilege to have such an eminent researcher from a prominent laboratory. On behalf of our principal, secretary, staff of Department of Physics, we welcome you, Dr. Olsen, to this webinar. I invite all the participants to have a fruitful session ahead. 
during the lockdown period good day thank you thank you ma'am uh, let me invite dr sister s jaisurani principal of jaira janapakyam college to give an introductory note about this webinar welcome sister how am i audible yes sister dear resource person of the webinar dr vigard skifter olin researcher department of physics university of oslo norway dr jacqueline regina mary head of the department of physics and convener of this webinar dr jagada christi assistant professor of physics and organizing secretary of this webinar other faculty members of the department of physics they are participants of this webinar a very pleasant evening to everyone of you alloys are a mixture of a number of different metals and other elements each lending their own properties to the compound they exhibit unique properties by blending together the best properties of the metal and elements they incorporate they are created through the careful combination of different elements they are specific, specific uh, specifically crafted to enhance the properties of the metals and elements they contain as well as to engineer specific characteristics alloys play a very important role in our daily life in fact without using an alloy one day is also not passed utensils in the kitchen vehicle mobile phones etc are various alloys which are being used and made by human even most of the machinery tools and the engineering equipments are made up of alloys this is a real international webinar of jairaj anapakim college yes dear participants we are going to hear the research findings of a norwegian researcher from the university of oslo i hope this webinar will give you a deep insight on various types of alloys tailoring their band gap and ways of improving the properties for practical applications at this juncture i congratulate the conveners for selecting a researchable topic as functional properties and band gap engineering of zinc oxide gallium nitrate alloys i also appreciate their meticulous efforts in planning and conducting this webinar in a successful manner thank you may god bless you stay hope and stay safe enjoy this art bye bye thank you sister uh, it's my pleasure to invite dr sister bj queensley jaindi to felicitate this webinar dear jagada i am audible yes sister am i audible jagada am i audible stay your audible sister your audible sister okay thank you yes. a very warm good evening to you all at the outset i hold heartily welcome our resource person dr v gard skifted oslo research department of physics oslo norway for kindly accepting our invitation to be the resource person to lead this webinar i cheerfully welcome all the energetic and enthusiastic participants to this webinar we are in the fifth level of lockdown period though the outbreak of covid 19 pandemic has captured us in our home we the academicians are able to find out alternative avenues to enrich and equip our knowledge thereby smoothening of our mental stress let us thank god for giving us these wonderful blessings i take this opportunity to convey my appreciation to dr mrs a jacqueline regina mary hod of 
PG and Research Department of Physics and the organ convener of this webinar, Dr. Mrs. A. Jagada Christi, Assistant Professor of Physics and the Organizing Secretary of this webinar for organizing this webinar by taking much effort and organizing the right topic and inviting the right person for the right topic. I hope our eminent and erudite resource person will make you more resourceful through his uh, webinar. I hope may this uh, webinar be a delightful and fruitful one. May you be inspired and influenced by the lectures of our resource person. May God be with you. May God bless you. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you so much for your felicitation. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Vegar to handle the session. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. It's audible. Wow, can perfect. Hear. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Did he host? So am I sharing the correct screen now? You see the presentation in full view? Okay, great. Yes, sir, it's correct. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so thank you so much for this kind introduction and thank you for allowing me to present my work. Uh, as you already said, my name is uh, Vegar Schiftstolsen and I'm from uh, Norway. So just to, for those of you who haven't been in Norway before, um, uh, it's this small country uh, up in north, uh, northern part of Europe. Uh, I've also uh, placed uh, the map of Norway here and as we can see, we're now in uh, Oslo, which is the capital of Norway, uh, in the southeast of uh, Norway. But I'm from uh, the west coast of Haugesund, so this this uh, small town here is is my hometown. So I've been living in Oslo now for uh, approximately ten years. So Norway is. Uh, or we're of course very proud of our country and uh, beautiful nature. Uh, Norway is known for their uh, high and beautiful mountains and fjords, uh, as well as uh, the Northern Lights that are very uh, popular to, to see during, uh, during um, uh, in the, let me just see, sorry, like this. Um, in the winter months of the northern parts of Norway. So Oslo has also uh, things to, to be seen. We have a new opera house, uh, which is very popular, as well as uh, Norwegians are very known and uh, proud of their skiing culture. So we have this huge ski, uh, ski jump um, stadium, which is filled up every weekend uh, during the winter months. I work at the University of Oslo and our research group is called the light and electricity from novel semiconductors, abbreviated LENS. So this is our group, group photo. Um, as you already mentioned, we do our work in uh, the Micro and Nanotechnology Laboratory, which is shortened for MINA Lab, which is a collaboration between different infrastructures of uh, Norway. And this collaboration is called uh, NORFAB. Uh, 
so uh, in addition to the university clean room, we have the clean room at Sintef, as well as two clean rooms in, uh, in uh, Tonheim and Horten as well. So we have a 440 square meter clean room. And we do fundamental research, but ap application motivated fundamental research, uh, especially on semiconductors. So we do everything from, from uh, especially um, synthesis of semiconductor materials using various different techniques. We also have, um, for instance, using sputtering as I will present today. We also have uh, different methods to, mani to manipulate the materials, for instance, using our uh, ion implanters. We can dope materials, we can alternate the, the electrical and physical properties of the material. Of course, we do have quite a large number of characterization techniques, both in terms of optical, electrical, and structural properties. Um, and we also have an increasing focus of, um, of theoretical work as well. So we're doing modeling, uh, modeling, uh, or making models for different characterization techniques, as well as using uh, first principle calculations as DFT. And then we are also doing small fabrication of devices because we want to, to see if um, um, our research uh, can be applied to different applications. So it's very exciting. Um, so the main focus is that we have uh, at the University of Oslo or in our research group now is, um, is materials towards solar cell applications and uh, other optoelectronic applications as LEDs and uh, detectors. We also have a, um, a growing, growing um, focus on power electronics using, for instance, uh, the development of gallium oxide and we're also focusing uh, more and more towards quantum computing uh, using semiconductors and, um, and uh, point defects in, for instance, silicon carbide. <clears throat> but, so I'm here to talk about my work uh, and as you already kindly uh, introduced my work, and PhD thesis is entitled Functional Properties and Band Gap Engineering of Zinc Oxide Gallium Nitride Alloys. So I've divided my presentation into three parts. Um, first, we're going to about, or after a short motivation for why doing this study, we're going to talk about alloying zinc oxide and gallium nitride using mangtron sputtering and discuss some of the as grown results. Then we're going to talk about the effects of post-growth annealing uh, and how this uh, affects both the structural and optical uh, properties of, of the material. And before I conclude my presentation, we're going to talk about uh, this band bowing effect, which is observed uh, in, um, in the zinc oxide gallium nitride alloy among other materials as well, and why this um, why this band bowing effect actually occurs. <clears throat> so, zinc oxide and gallium nitride are two ma semiconductor materials with uh, extremely good optoelectronic uh, properties, and they're both quite similar materials, even though uh, gallium nitride is nitride, of course, and zinc oxide is an oxide. Um, they both are direct band gap semiconductors with uh, fairly similar band gap energies at 3.3 uh, and 3.5 EV uh, for zinc oxide and gallium nitride. And this means that the band gap energy is corresponds to the UV part of the uh, spectrum. 
In addition, both materials share the same crystal structure, which is the vertite uh, crystal structure, and they also have fairly similar lattice constants. And this makes them uh, suitable for alloying. Both materials have also faced the same type of challenges, uh, especially when it comes to electrical properties uh, and p-type conduction. It's been found that it's extremely challenging to obtain uh, a low resistive and stable p-type conduction for both materials. But as we all know, the um, in the 1989 and 1990, um, a low resistive and stable p-type conduction was actually achieved for gallium nitride by using magnesium doping. And uh, uh, research highlight in gallium nitride-based uh, research came then in 2014, when uh, Amano, Akasaki, and Nakamura were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for invite, uh, inventing the blue LED, which enabled the white LED. And this was all based on gallium nitride alloys and uh, was uh, made possible due to this, um, uh, to the obtaining of the low resistive and stable p-type conduction of gallium nitride. For zinc oxide, on the other hand, uh, low resistive and stable p-type conduction hasn't uh, been realized. But zinc oxide is, is very much used in transparent conductive films and uh, photo detectors. So, as I mentioned, the band gap energy of zinc oxide and gallium nitride are uh, or corresponds to the UV part of the system. And here I've plotted the band gap energy on the y axis versus the alloy composition on the x axis. So, zero corresponds to pure zinc oxide and one corresponds to pure gallium nitride. So as we can see, the band gap energies of the two host materials corresponds to the UV part of the system, but it has been found that as we introduce the one material into the other, the band gap energy is decreased or reduced, and uh, it is reduced quite significantly well into the visible part of the spectrum. And this is... Uh, an interesting feature because it's it's kind of a deviation from Vega's law, which predicts a linear variation between the two host materials, both in terms of band gap energies as well as lattice constants. So, and it has also been found that this band bowing effect, as it's called, uh, is asymmetrical, and this means that the band gap energy is reduced faster and more if we introduce gallium nitride into zinc oxide in this area compared to uh, introducing uh, zinc oxide into gallium nitride. Maeda et al. Uh, with his uh, um, research group were the pioneers using this zinc oxide gallium nitride alloy and they used um, this uh, reduced band gap for hydrogen production so they synthesized the zinc oxide gallium nitride alloys as photocatalytic particles and used the reduced band gap of the alloys to split water under visible light and uh, hence to to produce as uh, hydrogen. And this was actually published in Nature in 2006. So our goal with this work has been to try to combine zinc oxide and gallium nitride using mangtron sputtering. So we wanted to make as crystalline and um, as crystalline films as possible with the highest uh, crystal quality that we could obtain. Um, and to use the vertite crystal structure uh, as a constant. So we wanted to uh, maintain the vertite crystal structure 
uh, while alloying because there has also been done uh, very much interesting work by changing all elements uh, of this alloy. So, so you, you can make uh, everything from zinc oxide to gallium nitride to gallium oxide and to zinc nitride. But then the crystal structure will also change. So we've tried to just keep the um, vertside crystal structure constant uh, because of the superior optoelectronic uh, properties of zinc oxide and gallium nitride. So we've tried to reduce the band gap uh, significantly well into the um, visible part of the spectrum. And we also tried to understand or obtain a deeper understanding for why this band bowing effect occurs and what mechanisms are governing this band bowing effect. And all this for the potential use in optoelectronic applications as solar cells and photodetectors uh, and light emitting diets, of course. So, <clears throat> Um, I've grown my films using RF magnetron sputtering. And for those of you who are not familiar with magnetron sputtering, um, magnetron sputtering is based on the ionization of a gas um, in a vacuum chamber. So you ionize the gas uh, forming a plasma and you apply a, a bias to a target material. So you accelerate the ions towards the target material it uh, bombards the surface of target material and sputters off atoms and molecules in the direction of a substrate. In this work, I've used two separate targets, one with pure zinc oxide and one with pure gallium nitride. And by uh, tuning the applied target powers as well as nitrogen flow during growth, we've obtained uh, films with, or stoichiometric films with, um, uh, varying gallium nitride content from 0%, uh, meaning pure zinc oxide, up to about 20% gallium nitride. So from the uh, X-ray diffraction or XRD results, we see no secondary phases uh, uh, for gallium nitride contents below 20%. The C lattice constant is increasing uh, with um, with the increased uh, gallium nitride content, which we can see uh, in this graph here. So I have plotted the C lattice constant as a function of, again, alloy composition. And as we introduce more gallium nitride, the, the C lattice constant is increased like this. So the C lattice constant is calculated from the peak position of the 0002 reflection of the bird side crystal structure and compared to that of bulk zinc oxide. And this increase in, in um, C lattice constant is also, um, is also opposite to what's predicted by Vega's law. So Vega's law, again, is, it predicts a linear variation between the two host materials. So the C lattice constant should decrease um, slightly by introducing more gallium nitride into zinc oxide. In this case, we believe that this increase uh, is due to strain films because we're talking about magnetron sputtering, which is a physical um, deposition method, um, as well as using quite or relatively low growth temperatures, um, especially when compared to, to growth of gallium nitride which is normally grown at uh, eight, to, uh, eight to 900 degrees. These films are grown at, um, at uh, 400 degrees Celsius. We also did um, transmission electron microscopy, which confirms that the films are what we call a random alloy. And in that, it means that there, is no, there are no regions of pure zinc oxide or pure gallium nitride, at least within the detection limit of the TM. The alloy films also show a good heteroepitaxial relationship to the substrate, which is C-plane sapphire, and that the unit cell of the alloy is rotated 30 degrees uh, with respect to that of the substrate. And this is normal for, um, 
for zinc oxide, for instance, uh, grown on seaplane sapphire, because the um, in-plane rotation of the unit cell decreases the lattice mismatch uh, to the substrate. Furthermore, um, the films contain a high density of threading dislocations, which can be seen from this uh, weak beam dark field TM image here. And uh, from XRD rocking curve scans using the full width at half maximum, in addition to uh, RBS measurements, which are which is rooted for the backscattering spectroscopy, the combination of these two show that the structural distortion increases with increasing gallium nitride content, which um, which we can also see from the TM results. The band gap energy we can see is quite. Uh, quickly reduced as we introduce gallium nitride into zinc oxide, and we um, we um, obtain a um, band gap minimum by uh, introducing roughly seven percent gallium nitride into zinc oxide. After this, no larger variation in band gap energy is observed, so we see it quite. A rapid decrease and then it's more stable um, or more invariant to uh, stoichiometry uh, to compositional variations and this can also be seen from from Maeda's uh, results using um, uh, or introducing zinc oxide into gallium nitride so they also observe this uh, rapid decrease in um, in band gap energy whereas it's uh, more stable for um, for um, variations in in the composition, this reduced band gap, which is measured by optical absorption or uh, transmission measurements, is also corroborated by EELS uh, measurements, which is um, electron energy loss spectroscopy using the TM. And from EELS measurements, we also see that the band gap reduction is relatively homogeneous over the probed area, which again means that we don't see any pure zinc oxide or pure gallium nitride regions uh, yielding band gap energies of in, in the range of 3.3 and 3.5 EV. Furthermore, we did um, or used uh, theoretical calculations uh, and calculated the, uh, the band gap energy using the quasi uh, particle approximation GW. And what we can see here, which, and the calculations is uh, presented with the purple diamonds here. So we, what we can see is that the uh, theoretical calculations are quite in a quite good agreement with uh, the experimentally obtained results. So, so far we've seen that we have uh, quite, um, or the films are not in thermal equilibrium because we're using magnetron sputtering, we're depositing at um, quite low deposition temperatures, and the films contain strain and a high density of dislocations. So what we wanted to do is to, to um, manipulate the properties by, by uh, doing post-growth annealing. So we annealed um, the films at 600 degrees and 700 degrees and 800 degrees, all in nitrogen flow for uh, one hour each, and, um, and observed the evolution of the different properties uh, within this post-growth annealing. What's interesting is that the, the optical properties might, of course, also change with this, uh, with bringing the material closer towards thermal equilibrium. And the band gap of zinc oxide gallium nitride alloys is predicted to change when we uh, bring the material closer towards thermal equilibrium. So, after the last annealing step, 
we see a structural improvement. The C lattice constants for all compositions uh, are reduced, uh, approaching the predicted values of Vega's law. In addition, we see a, um, uh, or this, this um, reduction in C lattice constant can be, can be, uh, or it implies that we reduce the strain uh, and uh, move the material closer towards thermal equilibrium. From, from the XRD rocking curve scans and TM, we also see that uh, we have a reduction in dislocation density, and we also have an increase in grain size or grain width, as we can see from, um, from the two images or two TM images that, uh, that I've uh, posted on this slide. So this is the Ascron sample which has an average grain width of 20 nanometers, whereas after the um, last annealing step at 800 degrees, the same average grain width is approximately 50 nanometers. And um, <clears throat> uh, this increase in grain size is due to the coalescence uh, of grains during annealing. So we see that we have an increase in overall structural quality, um, but the full width of half maximum or the broadness of the 0002 reflection uh, from the XRD scans shows a systematic broadening uh, with annealing. So in this graph here, we have the full width of half maximum um, versus the annealing temperature, where the black one is pure zinc oxide, which uh, shows a reduction in full width of half maximum with annealing, and which is normal for sputtered films since they're out of thermal equilibrium. So as you anneal, the, you improve the overall structural uh, quality. Whereas for the alloys, we see this systematic increase in, in uh, full width of maximum. And an increase in full width of half maximum could either be a reduction in crystallite size or, uh, and hence also uh, reduced crystal quality. But we see from the last slide that the overall crystal quality increases and the grain size increases. So it can't be because of this. So what we believe is that the increase in full width at half maximum is, uh, is because we have a growing second contributions uh, from uh, what we term cluster formation on, uh, on the nanoscale, which means that um, we have an increase in gallium to nitrogen bonds um, with annealing. So we did theoretical calculations on this as well. So DFT was employed to calculate the total energy of a variety of different configurations for atoms for the same composition, which is approximately 20% gal nitride and 80% zinc oxide. So we calculate difference in formation energy as a function of the number of gal nitrogen bonds. And as the number of gal nitrogen bonds increases, the the difference in formation energy is reduced. So this means that the cluster formation or an increase in uh, gallium to nitrogen bonds is more energetically favorable. And there has also been done quite um, many studies on, on this cluster formation for this alloy. And this cluster formation is actually predicted to change the band gap of, or affect the bang up of the alloys as well. Uh, for zinc oxide gallium nitride alloy, a blue shift of the band gap is predicted as, uh, as cluster formation occurs. So we, we reduce the band gap by alloying, and as uh, cluster formation occurs, we increase the band gap uh, again. And this is different for, for instance, the zinc oxide indium nitride uh, alloy, where cluster formation is predicted to further reduce the band gap energy of the material. But in our case, there's no systematic change in the band gap energy. 
as we can see on this graph here, which is um, the um, direct band gap, again, as a function of annealing temperature. So we do see some changes here, but there is no systematic change in the band gap. And those changes that we do see might, uh, might be explained by the increase of crystal quality because we have fewer localized states. We, um, we have um, sharper absorption onsets. And, uh, and these might all um, affect how we interpret the, uh, the tau plots, which again means that uh, we do see some changes. A second observation that we did after, after uh, the last annealing step, uh, which you might have noticed in, uh, in the last TM image that I showed you, is this uh, dark spots um, observed in the material. And these dark spots are actually nano-sized voids found mainly along grain boundaries and third degree locations. And these voids were found to be filled with molecular nitrogen. So we did local yields measurements one inside a void and one outside a void, which we can see here. So we have uh, measured yields inside a void and, um, and outside a void um, in the zinc oxide gel nitride matrix for reference. And the yield spectrum here shows that, um, shows that the, the, uh, the P corresponding to nitrogen resembles uh, molecular nitrogen uh, within the void, whereas outside the void, the, the peak resembles more of nitrogen bonded to gallium in gallium nitride uh, matrix. We also did the time-resolved yield measurements by drilling a hole in a void using the electron beam and doing simultaneous uh, yield measurements and we saw that as we drill the hole, the nitrogen, um, the nitrogen signal disappeared. So we emptied the void um, using um, by drilling a hole, which again can confirm that we have uh, molecular nitrogen present. So the formation of these voids are attributed to the agglomeration of zinc and gallium and vacancies, and the filling of uh, the voids with molecular nitrogen is attributed to the low stability of nitrogen on oxygen site, which has also been found in nitrogen implanted zinc oxide. So I also wanted to talk about this band bowing effect and the main results that we obtained by investigating the mechanisms governing this band bowing effect. So the band bowing effect has been a uh, focus for many research groups and it has mainly been explained by using theoretical results. So we wanted to combine theory and experimental techniques to obtain a deeper understanding about why this band bowing effect occurs. So the band gap reduction has been explained um, mainly by repulsions between the nitrogen 2p and 3d orbitals within the valence band of the, the alloy and these repulsions pushing the valence band maximum upward in energy and hence also reducing the band gap energy of the alloy as you introduce uh, one material into the other. We believe, on the other hand, that this band bowing effect occurs because we're forming a defect band or a gallium nitride-like defect band within the band gap of zinc oxide as we introduce gallium nitride into zinc oxide. And this is because although zinc oxide and gallium nitride has fairly similar band gap energies, their position with respect to the vacuum level is somewhat different. And this means that the valence band maximum of gallium nitride 
lies about one EV higher than it does for zinc oxide. So what we believe is that as you introduce gallium nitride into zinc oxide, you're introducing gallium nitride like defect states uh, above the valence band maximum of zinc oxide. And this causes this um, decrease in band gap energy. And as you have um, introduced enough gallium nitride into zinc oxide, you um, obtain this continuous um, defect band and hence um, more, uh, more introduction of gallium nitride will not reduce the band gap energy any further. So this is why we believe that uh, we have this rapid decrease and then a more flattened band gap um, uh, to composition variation before it then increases sharply again here. And this defect band model has also been used for other material systems as well. For instance, the zinc oxide zinc sulfide material system. So from up to this point, we've only talked about band gap in terms of absorption. And from absorption, we see that there's a um, significant decrease in band gap energy as we introduce gallium nitride into zinc oxide. So we wanted to do uh, photoluminescence measurements uh, to measure the emission of the um, uh, alloys as well. And what we can see from this uh, PL uh, plot here, which shows the, um, the black curve uh, corresponds to pure zinc oxide, then we have uh, roughly 2% gallium nitride, which is the red one, and 15% gallium nitride, which is the blue one. And what we can see is that the near band emission peak here, uh, there's no red shift or no reduction in band gap energy when we evaluate the near band emission. In fact, the near band emission for all alloy samples resembles that of pure zinc oxide. Whereas the main changes occurs in the deep level um, um, emission peaks here. And this we believe can argue that the defect band model can explain this discrepancy between the absorption and the emission. Because since a defect band or with a defect band, um, um, with a defect band made or uh, uh, introduced above the valence band maximum of zinc oxide, this transition here can act as absorb, uh, absorption, whereas, um, whereas uh, emission from uh, the conduction band to valence band maximum of zinc oxide still remains a viable route of emission. So this is why we believe that photoluminescence can uh, also uh, explain why we see this discrepancy between the absorption and emission of the alloys. On the other hand, if we take, um, if we look at this uh, orbital repulsion uh, hypothesis for band gap uh, bowing of the alloys, we would believe that if you're actually pushing the valence band maximum of the alloy upward in energy, you would also see a red shift of the near band emission peak. So we did, again, theoretical calculations. So we plotted the uh, partial atomic resolved density of states for pristine zinc oxide which is uh, this, um, this uh, blue graph here, and uh, evaluated with respect to the alloy composition of 20% gallium nitride, which is the red one. Uh, in the lower panel on the left here, we have divided the alloy um, uh, partial, dense, uh, partial atomic resolved density of states into zinc and oxygen uh, states and gallium and nitrogen states which are the uh, gallium nitride uh, or gallium and nitrogen is the yellow one and uh, zinc and oxygen is the light blue one. 
on the right hand side, we've just zoomed in on the um, on the band gap here, which again is zinc oxide and the alloy. And what we can see is that the conduction band is quite similar for both zinc oxide and and the alloy, whereas the reduction in band gap energy occurs to uh, due to changes close to the valence band maximum. And this vertical line here represents the valence band maximum of zinc oxide. So if we look at the partial atomic resolve density of states, we can see that this, uh, this, uh, these density of states above the valence band maximum of zinc oxide actually occurs due to gallium and nitrogen states uh, formed above the valence band maximum of zinc oxide. So this again, we believe is a evidence of the band bowing effect for the zinc oxide gel nitride alloys um, happening due to the introduction of a defect band within the, vein, uh, within the band gap of zinc oxide as we introduce gel nitride into zinc oxide. So in summary, we've fabricated highly crystalline zinc oxide gel nitride alloy thin films using Mangtron sputtering. The band gap was reduced uh, significantly, uh, significantly sorry, from 3.3 EV to approximately 2.5, 2.4 EV by only introducing gal nitride. After annealing, we moved the material closer towards thermal equilibrium where nano-sized cluster formation is a probable effect. The formation of nitrogen filled voids along grain boundaries and threading dislocations were also observed. And we, we saw the, that there was this discrepancy between the measured absorption and the measured um, emission. And this we believe is due to a defect band model uh, or defect band being um, being formed within the band gap of zinc oxide as we introduce uh, gal nitride into zinc oxide. So this talk is based on the following papers uh, by me and my co-authors. Um, we've also one manuscript that we're, um, that we're preparing for publication now. So for more in information, you could, um, you could visit my research gate uh, profile. Um, and I'm happy to, to share my results for, uh, with anyone who is interested. So I would just like to thank all my co-authors, uh, my three professors that were my uh, supervisors uh, during my PhD, Professor Lasevinas, Professor Andrei Kutznesov, and Professor Bengt Svensson, and all the co-authors that has contributed with uh, both uh, experimental measurements, uh, DFT calculations, and discussions. I want to thank you all for your attention. I hope you all stay safe and I hope you all stay healthy. So thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Oslin. Uh, it's, it's a very, very informative uh, research speech. Thank you for it. And the participants, those who are having any questions can uh, raise up your hand signal actually here. So if you wanna converse to Dr. Oslin, please raise hand uh, in the chat box. Um, Mr. Pon Lakshmanan, are you ready to ask questions? Mr. Pon Lakshmanan? Mr. Pon Lakshmanan? Close for nearly two minutes. Close it. Ms. Bhavaneshwari? Ms. V. Bhavaneshwari? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ah, yes, ma good evening, sir. Nice presentation, sir. 
हेलो हेलो आमे एडबल हेलो ये आवर ओर दा अनम्यूट करो हेलो सर हेलो आ सर गुड इवनिंग सर नाइस प्रेजेंटेशन सर थैंक यू सो मच आई आस मेनी क्वेश्चन सर इन योर चैट बॉक्स uh first question is the base uh, this is funny question sir uh, that is whether the regards law it is arrived from your name sir sorry okay let me ask the next question sir uh, what is the role of c lattice constant uh, of uh, both the semiconductors gallium nitride and zinc oxide uh, in affecting the functional properties of this alloy so so um the um the atom positions of of semiconductors will naturally uh, affect the band gap uh, of all materials uh, or all semiconductors so what we wanted to do is that we wanted to try to um relax the structure as much as possible so that we have as little strain as possible uh, since strain can also affect uh, the band gap energy of of the alloy um i hope that answers your question hello hello ah uh, yes so thank you sir thank you so much and what causes the rotation of unit cell to 30 degree with respect to the substrate sir it's the um, it's the reduction of the lattice mismatch so so if if you grow if you grow um, or if the unit cell of the alloy will would be uh, without any in plane rotation you would have a higher lattice mismatch uh, between the substrate and the film um, okay so so by um, and this is something that happens uh, naturally when growing zinc oxide on uh, on seaplane sapphire because it reduces the lattice uh, mismatch between between the two materials thank you sir thank you sir and what is the reason for the formation of nano sized voids so this is what we believe is due to the clustering of zinc and gallium vacancies so we have uh, sputtered sputtered um, material so we have a uh, quite high um, concentration of defects and um, uh, especially also uh, uh, vacancies both zinc and gallium vacancies so we believe that these these uh, vacancies agglomerate especially along threading dislocations and grain boundaries and this is what forms these nano sized voids thank you sir thank you for your nice presentation thank you mr bhuneshwari thank you, so thank you uh, dr akash dr akash are you online yes madam ah uh, yes sir you can proceed yes yeah. uh, what is the value of berlua zone in the lattice sorry berlua zone sir can you repeat uh, the question sir Uh, oh, what is the value of berlua zone in the lattice what is the value of the berloin zone in the lattice ha ah, ha ah, yeah. um that that i'm actually not sure of. sorry okay okay sir thank you sir thank um, you thank you very much sir nice lecture sir thank you so much i am skiti ms skiti are you online मेटीरियल so what we wanted to do was that um for instance um let's let's take uh, the um the um 
example of zinc uh, or galnitride with indium galnitride, which is the alloy that is used in almost all LED technology today. But uh, indium galnitride and galnitride, um, it's a very hard alloy to make because the uh, uh, because of um, the difference in in growth temperature as well as the phase separation uh, that occurs when when the indium nitride concentration exceeds. So what we wanted to do was try to use zinc oxide and gal nitride, which are two materials with uh, UV uh, emission, and reduce that into uh, well into the visible part of the spectrum. So the idea or the the best case would be if we could tune the emission of the alloy from UV and well down into the visible spectrum, for instance, by doing uh, LEDs. So, but what we saw, as I also uh, explained in lecture, is that the emission doesn't change. So the emission still resembles that of pure zinc oxide. Whereas the absorption that reduces uh, by introducing zinc oxide or gal nitride in zinc oxide. So this can this can uh, obviously be used for for instance uh, solar cell applications as absorber, for instance. Whereas uh, uh, it's more doubtful that it can be used for LED technology. Hope that uh, answers your question. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Well. Thank you, Ms. Kirti and okay. uh, uh, Dr. Swati. Dr. Swadi Mehra, are you online? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Ah, you can proceed, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. Actually, good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, actually, I have the same uh, question regarding the low band gap application and the yeah. high band gap applications of the thin films. Actually, I was working on copper sulfide and copper selenide thin films. So I was more interested in uh, whether they can be used in the solar panel cells. So it will be in decreasing the uh, valence band gap, right? So if at all the band gap is more than four electron volt, is there any specific application area in which they can be used? If the band gap is more than four EV? Yeah, four EV, but it can be, I think, not included in the semiconductors, right? No, that would be more like insulators. Yeah, they will be like insulators and they can be used, I think, in uh, infrared uh, reflectors, I think, right? Yeah, but uh, so so um, we don't see any increase in uh, in band gap energy from from uh, the 3.3 and 3.5 EV of gallium nitride and zinc yeah. oxide. So we only see this reduction. So I haven't I haven't worked on any materials with a higher band gap than that. So according to you, uh, which is good, uh, having the low band gap or the high band gap for any of the material, not specifically to galvanite nitrate and uh, zinc oxide. I'm just uh, talking about the thin film area application. Yeah. Um, well, I mean that would depend on which application we're talking about, right? Yeah, so, and which material we are. Of course, so zinc oxide, for instance, I know uh, um, is very, very popular uh, in um, transparent conductive oxides for solar cell applications, so as uh, top contact. And that's, that you also, uh, of course, need a higher band gap uh, compared to the visible light so that you don't absorb anything. Whereas for LED technology, you should, um, you can also make UV LEDs as well. That's very useful, but it's also nice to, to be able to have, um, to have uh, visible LEDs and, um, and to use more um, environmentally friendly materials. Uh, okay, compared sir. to uh, to the more traditional materials. Thanks a lot, sir, and be safe in this scenario. And please, uh, so it much. was a very good presentation, and kindly share your contact address or mail ID, if possible, to all of the course. participants. Thanks a of lot, course. sir. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So if any of the participants are having any queries, you can uh, uh, raise hand signal.
and there are uh, some questions in the chat box too. Uh, can I read it for you, sir? Yeah, of course. Dr. L.C. Nehru asked a question like, what is the resistivity value of the post annealing sample? Yeah, um, let me see here. Okay, I haven't. Uh, um, I thought I had had uh, resistivity as well, but uh, I don't. But uh, um, no, uh, both samples or the as grown samples are quite uh, quite resistive uh, with uh, quite low mobile uh, or uh, mobility. Sorry. But as we into or as we do this annealing, we see that the um, the mobility increases uh, for both uh, both compositions. Um, we also try to anneal the films in forming gas, which is a um, mixture of nitrogen and hydrogen, uh, with the aim of of um, boosting the electrical properties. Um, but but uh, from, from the results that we obtained, the, the most efficient way to increase the mobility is uh, by doing this, um, this uh, post-growth annealing in, in nitrogen atmosphere at 800 degrees. Okay, so then the next question is, uh, Ms. Amuta asked, how to calculate the band bowing effect? Yes, so, so, um, the band bowing effect is usually um, calculated using this bowing parameter. Um, uh, let me see. I have the formula somewhere here. Can't uh, can't recall it. But but um, what's um, what's important is that by doing this calculation of the band bowing effect and using this bowing parameter, you will always get this parabolic um, band gap reduction. And this, we believe, isn't actually the case because you have uh, too sharp uh, reduction in band gap energy with a more uh, stable, stable um, uh, band gap variation. So what we could do then is by, by calculating or dividing into three different regions with the two, two uh, very high and very low uh, concentrations of the um, of the second material with a uh, uh, let's call them doping areas with uh, let's say uh, up to five five percent of um, of uh, either zinc oxide or gallium nitride, which has a very high or large bowing bowing parameter. But this larger uh, alloy composition uh, in between has a very low uh, or small uh, bowing parameter. Okay, thank you, sir. Here we have a, a hand raise. Uh, Dr. Arulmuli? Dr. Arulmuli? Yeah, I'm online. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Olsen, good evening. Good evening. Uh, sir, excellent presentation from you, sir. We had a nice evening with you. Thank you. Thank and you. my question is, sir, you said uh, uh, for selecting ZNO and the gallium nitride, their band gaps are uh, more or less equal. Is that the only reason for selecting these two semiconductors for making alloys? No. Um, the reason why we wanted to do with these two materials is that um, that they have quite good opto electronic uh, properties as emission of light and uh, the ability to, to tune the electrical properties. So gallium nitride is kind of a workhorse in LED technology and zinc oxide has the potential of becoming even greater material for opto electronic applications if, uh, if we're able to do um, the, uh, or obtain the p-type conduction of zinc oxide. So, so that was the motivation that uh, we have two materials with uh, superior optical properties 
uh, but both band gaps correspond to the UV part of the system uh, or spectrum. So what we wanted to do is to, to reduce the band gap of the alloy, but still have the superior optical properties as emission and absorption of, of, um, of the two host materials. Thank you, sir. No problem. Uh, and uh, one more question. Are you working on uh, any other combination of uh, semiconductors like this? Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm working on. Um, I'm working on a couple of different projects now. I'm working on the uh, growth of gallium oxide using uh, magnetron sputtering, and we're also working on two four nitrides for uh, for um, using magnetron sputtering. So, so zinc tin nitride, zinc germanium nitride, zinc uh, sil uh, silky nitride. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, sir. Actually, we have a question here uh, from yes. um, Ms. M. Gayatri. Which formulation is used for the band gap calculation of alloys? So, um, for, uh, for the band gap calculations, we used uh, GW uh, calculations. Since DFT calculations are, are known to to uh, underestimate the band gap uh, energy of any material quite significantly, of course, depending on which um, which um, uh, uh, functional that you use, but uh, but the GW um, the GW approximation should give uh, quite uh, quite okay uh, quite okay results. Okay, um, Ms. Chellamal, are you online? Ms. Chellamal? Ms. Chellamal? No. Uh, and we have other question here. What about the thermal stability of the material ZNO GAN alloy? Any phase change observed due to the phase change? Any change in the band gap? Uh, yes, so that's uh, excellent question. Um, no, we didn't see any phase change. Uh, we didn't. But then again, I focused on the zinc oxide rich uh, uh, region of the alloy uh, composition uh, range. So if we were to introduce a higher amount of gallium nitride, uh, since gallium nitride usually is grown at much, much higher temperatures, then I would expect uh, phase uh, separation and phase change um, into gallium oxide. Uh, but but uh, since, since the band gap energy decreased quite rapidly and stayed more or less invariant after, uh, let's say, 10%, then we didn't see the need to try to do the entire um, the entire um, composition range since the gallium rich side is quite heavily um, investigated already by other uh, research groups okay thank you sir here we have a participant um miss k chellamal miss k chellamal are you online Yeah, um, Miss Devi, are you online? Hello, Miss uh, Devi. Miss Devi. Miss Devi. Uh, Miss K. Chellamal. Ms. K. Chalamal, are you online? Yeah, again, Ms. Devi. Yeah. So I think uh, that's all about the questions, sir. Yeah, unmute him, yeah. Mm 
the unmute him there. So uh, I think we shall uh, move on for the vote of thanks uh, session. Uh, yeah, here we have a, a participant who is asking question, Miss Divya. Miss Divya. Miss Divya. Miss Divya, are you online? Miss Divya. Okay, so since there are no other questions, I think we can move on to the uh, order of thanks uh, session. So very good evening to one and all present here. It's my pleasure to propose vote of thanks for this webinar. My heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Sister J. Surani, Principal of Jairaj Hanabakyam College, and Dr. Sister B.J. Queensley Jayindi, my superior and uh, secretary of this college, for their constant encouragement and support ever, and especially to organize this webinar during this pandemic. It's my pleasure to thank our chief guest, Dr. Vegard Oslin, for a very effective presentation and for uh, answering the questions patiently. Thank you, sir. And my heartfelt thanks to Dr. A. Jacqueline Rachna Mary, convener and head of the department, and all the staff members of the department for their constant support for the successful accomplishment of this seminar. And my heartfelt thanks to, my personal thanks to Dr. Uh, Jayandinath uh, Mayandi for introducing uh, Dr. Oslin uh, to us. And thank you very much, sir. So by God's grace, it has come to the end. And thank you one and all for the, um, thank you one and all for, uh, um, for your successful uh, participation. And thank you, sir, for your very effective presentation. Our uh, unmute panna. Unmute panna. There. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for uh, <laughs> having me. Uh, it's been an honor. It's, actually, we have a question here. Shall I connect her, sir? Sure. Yeah. Miss um, Sophia Lawrence Mary. Miss Sophia Lawrence Mary. Sophia Lawrence Mary. Yeah, Miss uh, Jeba Austin. Miss Jeba Austin. So I think uh, that's it. So uh, let me connect to uh, Dr. Uh, Jacqueline Regina, Mary head of the department again. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. It was a very nice presentation. Actually, I did my research on zinc oxide. I made a thin films with a spray pyrolysis technique. It's a older technique, but anyhow, I made thin films and I was offering to have uh, films with low resistivity and uh, to reduce the band gap. So much we suffered and uh, I have made up a solar cell actually and uh, the cell has a very low efficiency and i was wondering and i was uh, I, I wanted to ask you actually the band narrowing effect and ba band widening effect both are coupled together and it is called as band bowing effect is it so sir yes band bowing effect can uh, both increase the band gap and reduce yes 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 okay thank you so much sir it was very interesting and, thank you thank and, uh, you so many questions are there but uh, some of the participants were asking in the chat box about your presentation it should be posted in the youtube so if uh, if you have any such idea and if you have any such prepared material please let us know so that you can post it in youtube to we'll think about it and uh, later we'll contact you okay thank you so much and uh, wish you all the best for your further research thank you so much thank you so much sir and uh, there is a funny question asked uh, like 
whether uh, Veg- Vegot's law is arrived from your name. Yes. Is it so? It's, <laughs> it's not the first time that question has popped into. Uh, oh. <laughs> Usually. So, no, it's, uh, it's not me. It's not uh-huh, me. It's not <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Maybe in the future. <laughs> Maybe in the future. Okay, wish you all the best. Thank you. Mm, thank you, sir. Thank you, sister. Thank you, sir. So, uh, shall we finish too? Yeah. Okay, sir. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sister. Thank you, sister. Thank you everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Went on well. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Pleasure, Mike. Thank you, sister. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm. End the meeting. Mm.